amazing. And so let's welcome Jeff now as he comes. Great. <coughs> Thank you, Carolyn. We had a great time. We, uh, we've got a little, little pod, little, uh, little bed on wheels uh, that we tow around. And so we just set off for an adventure, ended up at Carnarvon Gorge up in Queensland. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for everyone who filled in while we were away and enabled us to take that particular break. We've been looking at the, at the moment uh, around this theme of what song are you singing? All of us are singing some song. All of us have a song that resonates with our life, that comes out of our life. And so we've chosen a couple of popular secular songs that resonate with the fabric of our society, with the fabric of the culture in this place that we live. And we are unpacking that from a bit of a Christian perspective and exploring what is going on. And uh, today, I think, I will survive and thrive. You'll probably guess what the song is. We'll come to it shortly. I wonder how many of us have struggled with failure and disappointment. Am I the only person that's ever set out to do something and you've ended up failing? Am I the only person who's set out with high expectations or a dream or a vision, a strong desire or a plan, and my expectation is up here, and at the end of it, the reality is down here? And there's this gap there, there's this disappointment gap, there's this difference between what we expected, what we hoped for, what we wanted, and what actually happened, a disappointment gap. Or maybe that gap is so large that it's left us feeling, and I felt this at times, discouraged about our circumstances, about our life, about our situation, about where we're going, saying, Lord, what's going on here? I thought you were doing this in my life, but now I see that you're not, and I'm disappointed by that. I'm discouraged by that. I wonder how many of us have ever felt like giving up with something. We just feel like it's too hard. We feel like sometimes that we can't go on, and we ask ourselves the question, what's the use? And sometimes we can feel like quitting. But one thing I've discovered over my years of living on planet Earth is that nothing in life is ever achieved without perseverance. Yes, we fail sometimes. Yes, we're disappointed sometimes. Yes, the reality is sometimes below what we expect. But sometimes if we will persevere, if we will keep on going. I remember as a young boy seeing a black and white movie, an old black and white movie about Thomas Edison. I popped it up, please, uh, Levi. Just a picture of Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb and an electric storage battery. And this movie told the story of the tens of thousands of attempts he had at making an electric light bulb. We take electric light bulbs for granted now, but back in those days, there was no such thing as an electric light bulb. And he wanted to try and use this new thing called electricity to be able to bring lighting onto the streets and lighting into homes. And he had thousands and tens of thousands. One article I read said that he had 50,000 attempts at building a light bulb. 50,000! 50,000 things that didn't work, 50,000 failures. You know, it portrayed This movie portrayed the, the, the years of failure, the years of financial hardship he put up with, the years of strained relationships because he was single-focused on building this stupid light bulb, the, uh, the years of frustration pursuing this dream of an electric light bulb, and it showed his refusal to give up. People would tell him, it can't be done. Thomas Edison, give up. It can't be done. It's not possible. This is not going to happen. And, uh, but he refused to listen to them. Yes, he was discouraged, but that simply fueled his desire to succeed. He decided, I'm going to persevere with this thing, because even though I've had lots of failures, I'm not going to give up with this thing. Or what about in, in recent years, there's this young woman who finds herself divorced from an abusive husband, trying to raise a child alone. That she's dependent on welfare. She's struggling with severe depression and has contemplated taking her own life. She's trying to study to become a teacher so that she can earn her own living. But at the same time, she's trying to write this novel. She's had this idea about a novel and she's trying to write it down. It's an imaginary fantasy story. And so seven years it takes her. Seven years later, her circumstances haven't changed much except that she's finished this novel. She's finished it. And so once it's finished, she then has to go find a publisher. So she goes to one publisher and it's rejected. And another publisher and it's rejected. She ends up going to 12 publishers and each of them reject her book. Each of them say, no, we're not interested in publishing what you've done. But the 13th decided to publish it. The author was J.K. Rowling. 
and the book was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. It's an amazing story, isn't it? But she persisted. She didn't just sit down one day and write this book out. That book was written out of the middle of struggles in her life, massive struggles. It was written out of a desire to persevere and actually put pen to paper and build that and write that actual thing. It was a worldwide success. She went on to write six more sequels and she's now become the world's highest paid author. The world's highest paid author came out of those struggles. She could have said, oh, it's just too hard. But instead, she persevered. I could give you so many more examples of people who've achieved things because they have refused to, to give up. Steven Spielberg. You know who Steven Spielberg was? Indiana Jones and, and E.T. and Jaws and all of these great movies, which are, which are so interesting and, and uh, so interesting. But you know, he was rejected from the Film and Television University on three attempts. They wouldn't, he wasn't accepted. You know, You're not good enough. You can't come in here. And yet he persisted and kept on going. And I think he finally graduated from there only a couple of years ago. It took him 50 years to complete his degree, even though he had all of the, the great movies. Vincent van Gogh uh, had a vision to paint wonderful pictures. He said, yeah, I can, I can paint. I've got this vision. I want to paint amazing pictures. And he often had no food. He was so single focused. He had no food and he was depressed. But he managed to paint over 800 uh, pictures in his, in his lifetime. Do you know how many of them he actually sold? He sold one. He sold one to a friend who was feeling sorry for him, and he didn't get much money for that anyway. Now his, his paintings nowadays sell for multi-millions, 20, 30, 40 millions of dollars for each painting. Yet he didn't see any of that, but he was something burning in his heart. He said, I am going to continue to push. I will not give up. Which brings me to a young man in the 1970s by the name of Dino Ficaris. He was struggling with depression and with failure. He wanted to be a songwriter. Who wants to be a songwriter? Who is a songwriter? Isaac's a songwriter. We've got some songwriters in the church. He wanted to be a songwriter. He wanted to write hit songs that everybody would be singing. He had some talent, and so he was hired by the Motown label. Does anyone know who the Motown label is? Famous, yeah. Famous American Motown label that recorded some amazing, amazing music, some of the fun, most funnest music to play on the whole of the planet. Hired by the Motown label as one of its in-house songwriters. So he was there. He was working as an in-house songwriter. And for the previous seven years, he had been employed by Motown full-time to write for them. During that time, he had only had a couple of his songs that he'd written placed in movies. Just a couple of songs. So after seven years, they decided to fire him. They decided to get rid of him. He tells the story of spending days at home in his little cramped flat, just at home alone, depressed, with no sense of what the future might be in front of him. He battled rejection, he was battling failure, he was battling depression, and one day the TV is on and a movie is playing in the background. And he hears one of his songs that he had wrote in that previous seven years, he hears one of his songs in the background of this movie. And something sparks inside of him, something begins to well up, and he recalls this, he said, suddenly I felt a surge of hope begin to well up in my heart. And so he said, I, I felt this surge of hope. And so he began to jump up and down on his bed. And he began to call out, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be a songwriter. I will survive. I will survive as a songwriter. That became the inspiration for a song that he wrote. And so he got together with a fellow songwriter. And together they wrote one of the iconic songs of the 1970s. In the year 2000, this song that he wrote coming out of that experience of hope in his life, that song was voted the number one greatest dance song of all time. Billboard included it in the top 100 songs of all time. Rolling Stone magazine rated it as the number two best disco song of all time. And since its release, it's been recorded and released by 147 other artists have recorded it and produced their own version of it. Uh, on YouTube, the original version has 101 million views at the moment. And while it's been adapted as a, a breakup song, it's uh, sort of it's presented as a breakup song, as a song about a woman leaving an abusive relationship and the man wanting to get back together with her, and she says, no, you're not coming back. I've had enough of you. Get out the door. It's really about someone not giving up in the face of disappointments and struggles. Someone who refused to give up in the face of difficulties. Someone, uh, a young songwriter who finds hope for the future and it becomes more than just a song about surviving, it becomes an anthem for not giving up. 
I want to play just the intro, the verse and the chorus for that in just a moment. But uh, if you're watching online for this, we can't embed this in our, in our, our uh, recording of today's service. So, but we'll put a link down below so that you can click to it yourself at this point. Thank you, Levi. Let's run the original version recorded by Gloria Gaynor. Great song, isn't it? Who likes that song? Yeah. When Gloria Gaynor recorded this song, her mother had recently died. And she was also trying to recover from painful back surgery. People had said that the emotional pain that she was feeling and the physical pain that she was feeling bleeds into the song and gives it authenticity. She's not singing out of some theory. She's singing out of some pain that she's feeling currently in her own life, which brings this authenticity. This sing song brings with it also, though, a sense of hope in a world often filled with pain. All around us, people are challenged by life, challenged by struggles, like I mentioned before, and difficulties, challenged mentally, emotionally, physically, and relationally. And this song is a declaration of hope for the future. I will survive. I'm not going to be put down by this thing. I'm not going to be destroyed by this thing. I'm going to keep on going. I will survive. It's not all over. But here's something interesting. As I looked in the, this song, as I charted it over the last year since the 70s when it was written... It, it turned into something which was more than just surviving. It became a declaration of actually winning. It became a declaration of what it means to thrive in life, not just survive in life, to thrive in life. It became a declaration of what it means to be successful in the face of adversity. adversity. <clears throat> in the year 1998, the French soccer team was preparing for the World Cup. Now, the French, uh, like many people in Europe, love their soccer. They're mad about soccer. They have an obsession around soccer. But the French team had never won the World Cup. You know what the World Cup is? The Soccer World Cup. Soccer, the round game. They play with the round ball. They kick around. You're not allowed to touch it with your hands. You just use your feet and your head. Strange. <laughs> the soccer team carried the hopes of the French nation on its shoulders and they wanted desperately to win the World Cup. And so they chose this song to be the team's anthem for their World Cup campaign, I Will Survive. They chose it as their anthem, as their team's song. Before they would run out in the field, they would huddle together in the dressing rooms, and they'd, uh, the, ch the coach would give the, the speech, and they'd all put their hands together, and yay, we're going to win this thing. Then they would pump this song really loud, and they'd listen to I Will Survive as motivation for them. As they, uh, and that when they won a match, they played it as further inspiration after the match had finished to keep on winning. And there was a, a Dutch pop band called the Hermes House Band. Have you ever heard of it? No. Dutch House Band, the Hermes House Band. They recorded a special version of it with a la-la-la section so that people in the stadiums could sing along. They wouldn't know the words. In fact, this song would become, would boom from, the, from speakers during the match and with people joining in. And sometimes even spontaneously, the French guys would just start singing the la, la, la version themselves and they would break out. Let's just have a little brief, I haven't got any visuals with this, but I've got some audio, so let's have a listen to that. You get, got the idea, so it gets faster and faster. It's this whole thing, let's join in together. In that year, this French soccer team, under the inspiration of this song, That I Will Survive, they went on to win the only ever World Cup that they've won. They won the World Cup and they beat Brazil in the grand final 3-0. That's the way they did it. This song was written and recorded by black Americans. It's now been adopted by French football, not as an anthem for just surviving, but as an anthem for winning, as an anthem for success. And it's now become part of the French culture. Let me jump ahead uh, 18 years or so from, from that particular uh, version of the song. And another Dutchman records this song on tour in Germany. And it's now completed its transition as a song reflecting pain and hope for the future to a song carrying the exuberance of life. A song that celebrates life and, and living. And it's, by a, 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 it's led by a guy by the name of Andre Reu. Anyone heard of Andre? Okay, my mum loved Andre and she had all of his DVDs. And so we'd go around to her place, she'd be watching Andre Reu on the, on the DVD there. And when she passed away a number of years ago, she asked any of the, we were asked the kids, any of the kids want the DVDs? No, no one wanted them. 
grandkids, any of the grandkids want, the, no, no one wants the DVD, so I think they went to Vinnie's or somewhere. But as I was looking at this, this, um, this song, this version, it's, it, there's such an exuberance. It's no longer just a, a song about I will survive, I'm going to make it and there's going to be hope for the future. It's now this is the anthem for living life. So let's have a little clip from the Andre Rayo version of this. Wow. <laughs> They are more excited than some people in church sometimes, aren't they? They're more excited about, I'm going to survive, than what we get about Jesus Christ in the church sometimes. <laughs> Let me put this together as I, I, um, as I try and wrap this into some sort of shape this morning. <laughs> Hope is one of the most powerful emotions that we can tap into. Hope is an incredibly powerful emotion. Uh, Viktor Frankl was a Jewish man who survived for three years in four different German concentration camps during World War II. This is what he observed. He observed that those prisoners who lost hope very quickly died. But those with just a glimmer of hope, perhaps there was someone that was back home that they would be going back to, or there was some hope for the future, just a gl glimmer of hope, those people would survive the horrors of this concentration camp. Years afterward, he said this, as he thought about this whole thing about hope, he said this about hope, when hope exists, there is always a way. There are no hopeless situations, just people who have no hope. As followers of Jesus, we can have hope that our future is bright. You can turn to, you don't have to, but you could turn to the next person and point your finger at them and say, your future is bright. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. It doesn't matter what disappointment's in your world. It doesn't matter what you've failed at in life. Your future is bright because Jesus says it's actually bright. We will survive and thrive because we know that with Jesus' help, we can overcome obstacles. We can overcome hindrances. We can overcome difficulties, bad circumstances, every rejection, even disappointment we can overcome. And even when our circumstances don't seem to shift or change, when it seems hopeless, our hope and belief is still this, that Jesus has said he would never leave us. He would never abandon us. He would never leave us by ourselves. But he promised us as we invited him into our world, as we opened up our heart to his influence and his effect, that he would walk with us through life and hold our hand, walk beside us in the, as we navigated pain and challenge. So we mustn't fixate on what is the cause of the pain. Sometimes we can fixate on the disappointment. We can fixate on the failure. We can fixate on the struggle that we're particularly having. But Paul, writing into the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul says this about pain and about hope and about our difficult circumstances. He says this, this is the key, I forget those things that are behind me. Sometimes we fixate on the things behind us, don't we? We fixate on the struggle. We fixate on the, the disappointment. We fixate on the, on the pain of that particular stuff. But Paul says, no, I forget those things. Sometimes we have to forget some of that stuff. And he said, instead, I reach forward to what is ahead. I reach forward. Somehow he says, I'm not focusing on that behind, but I'm reaching forward in faith. I'm reaching forward to what God has for me. In other words, he wasn't going to let the past determine his future. Julie Crabtree, whom some of you know, uh, wife to Jeff Crabtree, good friends of ours and of the church here, shared with us a couple of years ago, from a Christian psychologist's point of view, what in her opinion were things that we do which are often are destructive to us, destructive things. And one of the things that she shared was catastrophic thinking, or catastrophizing, catastrophic thinking, thinking that the future is going to end battle. In her practice as a practicing psychologist, even amongst Christians, she said, they have so many people who come in and the thing that they're wrestling with in their mind and in their heart is this thing that nothing's going to turn out any good, that everything is going to be a catastrophe and uh, that things won't change, that we will fail, that we will come to nothing, that life is terrible. And for some of us, this catastrophic thinking happens at 3 a.m. in the morning. Or am I the only person who wakes up sometimes at 3 a.m. thinking nothing's working and everything's bad and everything's going to fall in a heap and you have worry and you have anxiety and you have fear and you wonder you can't get a good night's sleep because your brain begins to run away and you're catastrophizing. Paul the Apostle faced lots of things he could worry about, lots of things he could be anxious about, 
lots of fears. He, he had a difficult time, yet he says, I'm going to focus on reaching forward. And then he writes to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 4 and 11, verses 11 and 13, and shares his secret for being able to do that. Who loves a secret? Oh, I love a secret. I love it when someone says, oh, not many people know this, but I'm going to share it with you. But Paul actually wrote, he said, I'm going to share the secret of how I actually cope with all of this stuff that's in my life. And he says this, let's uh, pop it up there, thanks Levi. I have learned to be satisfied. Another translation says content. I've learned to be satisfied in what circumstances? All circumstances. Isn't that amazing? He had some pretty difficult circumstances. He had some pretty rough days. He had some pretty strong opposition. But he said, I've learned to be satisfied and content in all of the circumstances that I'm facing. And I know what it means to lack, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. Who loves the overwhelming abundance? I, I don't enjoy the lack very much. The lack sucks, sort of. But uh, you know, it keeps you praying and keeps you humble and keeps you seeking after God. But he says, I know what it means to have lack. I now know what it means to have an overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things. Everyone say the secret of overcoming all things. The secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. What I've found is the strength of Christ's explosive power influences me to conquer every difficulty. What I've found is the strength of Christ's explosive power influencing me to conquer every day. He said, this is a secret. Not many people know this secret, but there's, a, there's an ability that if you can tap into Christ's explosive power, if you can tap into that, then it will influence your world to be able to overcome every difficulty, every failure, every circumstance. You don't have to sing a song, I will survive. You just need the explosive power of Christ in your hearts that will help you to overcome every difficulty. This was Paul's secret for surviving and for thriving, Christ's explosive power. Well, here's the question, where does that explosive power come from? How do we access this explosive power? How do we make it relevant to our life? How do we tap in? Where's the socket that we can plug our, our, our light bulb into so that the explosive power can come through and touch our lives? You know, when we gather on Sunday, we're not just here to listen to a pep talk. My job is not to help you make you feel better about yourself or about your life or to wind you up and to give you a little pep. You can do it. Come on, you can do it. You can be stronger. You can be better. You can, you can overcome this thing. You can, you can do it. Come on, rah, rah, rah. I went to, uh, well, a long, long time of years ago, I went to a, a swappers meeting. Salesmen with a purpose, S-W-A-P. They called themselves swappers. And they asked me to come along and, and speak to them, and I did. And it was the, a crazy thing because they would start off... Uh, with a little ritual that they have, and they would do this. I'm alive and well, and I feel great. I'm alive and well, and I feel great. I'm alive and well, and I feel great. And that's how they sort of pep themselves up, ready to, to go out and to do their, their selling of whatever they were selling. We're not here to tell you you're alive and well and you feel great or you're going to do great. I do hope you are alive today and I hope you're well and I hope you do do great in whatever you're doing. But that's not the source of explosive power today. The church is not here just to give you a pep talk. We're not here just for good coffee and a chat. Although I am so appreciative of what's happening with the coffee cart and the, the great coffee that's there and the people who supply morning tea for us and the ability to catch up with friends and have a good chat. That's good, but there's no explosive power necessarily in that. We're not here out of religious duty. We go to church on Sunday because that's what we do. The Bible says we should do that, so I'm going to be a good little Christian and I toddle along and do my Christian duty of a Sunday. No, we're here positioning ourselves to be touched by God's presence and by God's power. We come here and position ourselves. We give up a couple of hours of our Sunday to come along. And there are benefits. There's other things that go on. But we're here because the God of heaven wants to touch your life, wants to touch you with his presence, wants to touch you with his power, wants to be a download into your world so that the, the power of Christ, Christ's explosive power, can help you to become an overcomer, can provide hope for your world, hope for your circumstances, can help you to get through the difficulties that all of us face in life. There's a, uh, there's a Jacob in the Bible. We have a Jacob here as well this morning. Yep, down here. There was a Jacob in the Bible. And this Jacob uh, was facing, up to this point, his biggest challenge in life. This Jacob in the Bible was a conniver. He was a schemer. He wasn't a very nice person. 
and uh, he decides he wants his, he was the second born, his brother was older and his brother had the, the birthright to the family farm and all of the stuff that went with that. And so he tricks his father into giving him the title deed. Tricks his dad into, he lies to his father, lies to his brother. He connives, he schemes. He's, uh, and then his brother, when he realizes what's happening to him, his brother is after him to try and kill him. His brother wants to kill him because he's such a rotter. He's such a, a person that, that's ruined things. And so he's running for his life. And uh, his future looked uncertain. His future looked bleak. And let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 28. We'll read the story of that. And it says there he's running away from his brother, and, uh, and he doesn't know where he's, he's just heading off. And at sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp for the night. And Jacob found a rock to rest his head against as he lay down to sleep. You know, it's a tough time when you have to use a rock as a pillow. That's, 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 that's tough. That's, that's difficult. You know, if you've got to, go to, to get down to that, that's, that's tough. And as he slept, he dreamt of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven. Another translation said there's a ladder. But there's a stairway stretching as he dreamed and he's got his head on this rock. There's a ladder there and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. They're moving up and down on it. And at the top of the stairway, he saw in this dream, the Lord was standing there. And verse 14, 15 are God's words to Jacob. They're not relevant to what I want to say here. You can read them yourself if you want. And then it goes on to verse 16. After this dream and this, the words of God has spoken to him, Jacob wakes from his sleep and he says this. He says, surely the Lord is in this place and I wasn't even aware of it. Isn't it amazing? Sometimes people can be in a place where the presence of God is and they're not aware of it. Somehow they're not tuned into it. Jacob wasn't aware that the, the Lord was in that place. What an awesome place, he said, this is. It's none other than the house of God. It's the, the very gateway of heaven. The house of God, the very gateway of heaven. This is an Old Testament picture of the New Testament church. It's an Old Testament picture. And we gather as the house of, this is the house of God. We gather the house of God. This is the, the gateway of heaven. And I believe as we gather Sunday by Sunday, there's a stairway that extends into heaven and something of heaven comes down to earth and something from earth goes up into heaven and there's a transaction that begins to take place in this place. Some people, like Jacob, aren't aware of it. They come to church and they go, oh, no. Oh. Other people are aware of it. They're aware it's the house of other people are, are having a transaction take place on Sunday mornings. And if Jacob, if like Jacob resting his head upon the rock, if we will rest our anxieties, if we will rest our fears, if we will rest our catastrophic thinking, if we will rest our rejection, if we will rest our, our pain on Jesus, the rock of our salvation, if we will rest that on Jesus, if we will rest our head on the work, the finished work of Jesus, then a transaction can begin to take place. Transaction can begin to take place. Anxiety can go up and peace can come down. Sickness can go up and healing can come down. Fear can go up and joy can come down. And God's explosive power can influence us to conquer every difficulty, every circumstance, every challenge. Let's take a moment. Uh, Sharon, I think Sharon's on keys today. Thank you, Sharon. Just come and play something nice behind me. Thank you. Can we stand to our feet this morning? <coughs> It's not just, I will survive, it's I will thrive. As followers of Jesus, we'll thrive. Let's take a moment to rest our head, not on a literal rock, but upon the rock Jesus Christ. Let's talk, bow our eyes, uh, bow our heads, close our eyes, that's it. Bow our eyes, close our heads. <laughs> Father God, Lord, I just thank you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You know, some of us here, what an opportunity for a transaction to play, take place this morning. What an opportunity. I don't know what it is that's causing you anxiety in your world. What's caused disappointment? What is it uh, bringing a sense of, I don't know what it is that's waking you up at three o'clock in the morning. But I do know that right now that transaction can take place. This is the house of God. This is the gateway of heaven. And right now, you can just release that thing to Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I just give you my anxiety around this issue right now. 
Lord, I give my, my disappointment around this issue. Lord, I thank you that some of these things that I'm feeling, Lord, I can give them up to you. And Lord, in place, Lord, something can come from heaven. Lord, the gateway of heaven is open this morning. So Lord, I pray for every person right here. I'm praying for transaction right now. Transaction. Thank you for change. Lord, I thank you for anxiety dissolving right now. Fear is broken in Jesus' name. Lord, depression, Lord, can go in the name of Jesus. Lord, disappointment. Lord, I break the power of disappointment in people's lives. Lord, I thank you for hope. Hope is powerful. And Lord, I pray there are no hopeless situations, just people without hope. And so I pray this morning, Lord, for people who are feeling it's hopeless, Lord, that a spark of hope, they would be like this young man who begins to jump up and down in his bed and a spark of hope comes into his heart and into his world and something comes out of that. Lord, I pray for a spark of hope in people's hearts who are feeling hopeless today. Lord, I thank you for strength, strength of your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I thank you for healing. Lord, many people across this congregation, Lord, this morning are in need of a physical touch, an emotional touch, a spiritual touch. They need healing in their world. And so, Lord, I thank you for a transaction, a healing transaction this morning. Lord, I thank you for healing in people's hearts, in people's minds, in people's physical bodies. Lord, we thank you for that right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, now we bless you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this Sunday. And uh, Lord, we thank you for your good hand upon us. Lord, go with us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, the rest of Sunday. And we'll see you next Sunday. I forget which song we're looking at. We've got two more songs to look at uh, next week and the week after. So God bless. See you then.